Welcome everyone to uh, Earth Day 2020. We have an excellent group of panelists joining us here. Um, we have Spike Mendelson, we have Chad Frischman, Seth Goldman, and Tracy McWhorter. Um, I wanted to just introduce this day, this wonderful celebration that we're all a part of on Earth Day. Um, today actually is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Um, in 1970, on April 22nd, 20 million Americans at the time, that was 10% of the entire US population, uh, came out and protested against what they called at the time environmental ignorance um, and really demanded a new way forward for the planet and focused that energy towards activism, lobbying and politicians. Um, and that's really credited with launching the modern environmental movement. Uh, and it was considered, you know, the largest civic event of the planet at the time. Um, and it led to the passage of these, home, these, uh, these landmark environmental laws, such as the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act. Um, and four years ago, of course, the Paris Climate Agreement was signed on Earth Day. Uh, so it's become recognized as this opportunity that we can really uh, think about our existence on this planet, our interaction with it. And how can we go forward um, knowing that we are dependent upon and one uh, with, with the planet Earth? Um, and I think what I'd love to, to do with this conversation is to really uh, explore the ways that we all can be a part of changing for, for the better um, for our environment. Uh, the founder, of Earth Day, the first Earth Day, shared this thought. Um, Despite the amazing success and decades of environmental progress, we find ourselves facing an even more dire and existential set of environmental global challenges from the loss of biodiversity to climate change to plastic pollution. And all of that calls for action at all levels of government. And while that's true, I, I think there's more than, than just action from government. There's actions that we all can take as business leaders, as researchers, as scientists, as chefs. Um, and that cannot be ignored because if we only think of change as coming from the top down, um, we then are in a, a situation where we have no uh, agency or control of the situation. So um, I think that's what I'd like to bring out of this conversation is to, to let all of you really explain how you have taken it upon yourselves in your life's work to be environmentalists and to be activists and fight for environmental justice, for food justice, for um, a planet that's inhabitable by uh, future generations. So um, with that, I wanted to give you all the opportunity to give an introduction to yourselves. I'll, I'll just start and say, my name is Jonah Goldman. I am one of the co-founders of Plant Burger and the Director of Strategic Marketing. Um, and I've in the past worked on uh, all sorts of companies in the natural food industry. And um, most recently was working on <laughs> alternatives to plastic, uh, single use plastics through compostable packaging. Um, when I transitioned to rejoin um, the food system and uh, be a part of creating Plant Burger or PLNT Burger, which stands of course for Planet Burger. Uh, and, and we intend to be a celebration of life um, and demonstrate to people that they can eat the change they wish to see in the world. Uh, and so again, I'm really thrilled. I'm so privileged and proud to be um, hosting this with you all today. And um, Spike, would you like to, to continue the introductions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm Chef Spike Mendelson. Uh, I'm uh, from the DC area, the DMB. Uh, I've been a chef here for about, uh, about 15 years now. Uh, I've opened multiple restaurants. I am uh, also the chef and co-founder of Plant Burger and get to work with uh, Jonah and, and Seth uh, a bunch. And, um, you know, uh, this day is such a special day for me. Uh, you know, I love this planet. I'm an outdoorsman. Uh, I enjoy eating lots of food. And, uh, you know, and my way of, uh, you know, uh, being environmentally conscious is through food. Uh, as I, I'm a chef, I like to work with ingredients. And, um, you know, um, at this time in my life, I like to make the right choices and promote uh, 
you know, uh, good farming uh, and, and uh, you know, this, this amazing vegan delicious food that we have going on at Plant Burger. I also chair uh, the uh, DC Food Policy Council on behalf of Mayor Bowser, uh, where we, we work on improving uh, the food system uh, through sustainable agriculture, uh, urban farming, uh, small businesses, uh, and uh, we concentrate a lot on, on food access. Uh, so that's, that's a little bit about me, and, and I'll throw it to Seth. <laughs> Thank you, Spike. I'll jump in, and uh, it's really fun to be part of this panel. I've been part of the food, um, I guess, movement uh, for over 20 years. I started Honesty out of my house over 20 years ago, and uh, was really then got the chance to um, focus on organic as a as an important choice for consumers and help to amplify that. And then I, um, about eight years ago, got involved with uh, Beyond Meat and. Uh, that really helped um, our family. Our family had become vegetarian, but we're struggling with choices. And so Beyond Meat has played a major role in making our food choices much more appetizing and much more immediate and available. And uh, I just, um, at the beginning of this year, transitioned to a new role as both a founder of Plant Burger, as well as launching a, a platform called Eat the Change. And Eat the Change is both nonprofit and for-profit. And so the the nonprofit element is we are uh, making grants to nonprofit organizations that help promote plant, uh, or I would say planet-friendly diets. And I look forward um, to talking with Chad about exactly you know, what that constitutes, but we took a lot of our guidelines from um, readingdrawdown.org. So we're so glad that he's here with us today. Um, and then the other piece of uh, Eat the Change is going to be a, a for-profit brand, a brand that seeks to incorporate the principles of plant-based eating, uh, embracing biodiversity in the diet um, and thinking about fact-based science to help democratize uh, planet-friendly foods. And I chose as my backdrop today a um, picture from Poplar, Animals, uh, Poplar Springs Animal <coughs> Sanctuary, which is in Poolsville, Maryland. And, and um, Poplar Springs is the place that put our whole family on this path towards, um, I would say, away from animal-based diets. We got to interact with some of the residents there. You see one of them behind over my shoulder. And just realize that, you know, if we could meet all of our nutrition and culinary and, you know, dietary needs without having to kill animals, that would be something that would be better for the planet and better for ours and certainly better for them too. So really glad to be part of today's dialogue. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Tracy, did you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. It's great to be here with everybody. And, um, I'm Tracy McWhorter again, and I am also from the DC, from DC, and uh, I've been vegan, <clears throat> been vegan now for 33 years. Um, I started in college um, thanks to a lecture that Dick Gregory gave at Amherst College in 1986 that rocked my world, <laughs> led me become vegetarian and then vegan. Um, and uh, eventually I changed careers from uh, being a museum director to becoming a public health nutritionist um, and have been um, working in this field in a variety of ways for, for the last 30 years as a director of the first federally funded vegan nutrition program, um, consultant for organizations to help their um, constituents go vegan, um, developing curricula for the DC public school system that was plant-based for K through 12. I've written a couple of books um, and uh, um, my, so a lot of things. Um, one, of the, um, one of the things that I'm um, most excited about that I'm working on right now is called 10,000 Black Vegan Women. And I launched that this year, and my goal is to help 10,000 Black women at least go vegan in one year. And that's to celebrate the 10th anniversary of my first book, By Any Greens Necessary. So my work focuses on particularly people of color and African Americans um, and, and helping us go vegan because we have the most to gain from continuing to eat this way and continuing to be leaders in this movement. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Chad, um, would you care to introduce yourself briefly? Sure. Hi there, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, my name is Chad Frischman. I am the Vice President and Research Director at Project Drawdown. 
Project Drawdown is a research and communications organization that is a collaborative effort from folks from all over the world that are mapping, modeling, and describing the most substantive solutions that when taken together as a system of solutions can achieve drawdown or that point in time when we start to uh, reduce atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases and start the process of reversing global warming. Um, it's a little bit about my background. Uh, most people do think that I am a atmospheric scientist, a climate scientist, and that is not true. Uh, though I have designed our models, our models are really not focused on defining the problem. Uh, we leave that to the atmospheric scientists, and that's an important part of the question. But we look at the solutions. And so we look at how we can actually uh, uh, apply technologies and practices that exist today. So we built models to evaluate that. But my background is really uh, in this nexus between uh, local and indigenous people's human rights and well being environmental conservation and sustainable development. And when you're in that nexus between these big issues, you obviously have to come face to face with climate change because these are the frontline issues that are going to be most impacted by the changing climate. Um, and so by addressing the solutions to the system of exploitation and extraction and moving to a system of regeneration and restoration built on the principles of equity and social justice, we can not only solve the climate crisis, but also empower local and indigenous communities, preserve and protect the environment, and uh, leapfrog ahead of traditional development trajectories to provide well-being for all. Um, and just as a quick other background, I also used to live in DC, though I'm the only one here who is not in DC currently. I'm in Berkeley, California. Back in those days, I was a historian, a historian of political economy. Uh, and my work really focuses on how we can change institutions and how we move institutions from uh, uh, hierarchies to more distributed systems that allow for more impactful uh, well being for most people on this planet. And just as a reference, to my background here, as you can see, uh, this is one of our solutions. It's called afforestation or tree plantations on degraded land. Well, this is drawdown in action every year by taking currently degraded land and, allow, and uh, using uh, planting trees for production, for our many uses such as buildings, materials, bridges, all sorts of things that we use timber. We can actually provide a solution right here by restoring currently degraded land and and uh, taking down all the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and putting into these things called trees and ultimately into our buildings and materials. So this is one of the solutions uh, at Drawdown. So that's me. Cheers, Chad, thank you so much. Wonderful introduction. Well, Spike, um, I, I wanted to start with you and ask you a bit about um, your perspective on climate change and diet. Uh, and I know that a lot of the time we think of solutions as out of our hands. It has to do with industry. It has to do with policy. Um, and I wanted to, to see, because you actually have, have a role not only as a restaurateur and an entrepreneur, but um, you're the chairman of the D.C. Food Policy Council, an outdoorsman as well. Um, and as you kind of transitioned uh, your businesses, I wonder how your awareness of the planetary crisis that we're in and climate change, if you want to call it that, um, has really had changed your worldview and influenced your work. Um, maybe starting like with when you uh, first learned about, about all of this. Sure. I'm, and, you know, climate change has always kind of been one of those things to me in the past that uh, it's, it's a big subject. Uh, it covers a vast variety of, 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 you know, solutions on what to do. And, um, it's at times somewhat confusing. Uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, I've been, uh, you know, a meat eater for, uh, you know, a lot of my life. And, uh, you know, I happened to meet my wife, uh, you know, Cody a few years back and she was vegan. So she kind of turned me on to, you know, all these alternative ingredients and foods uh, that I really hadn't ever really, uh, you know, ha had never been in my life and I had never really played with. And, um, you know, after meeting Seth and, uh, you know, uh, at a panel and him giving me these Beyond Burgers uh, that were completely plant-based, it, it's kind of what struck that light bulb, uh, you know, in, in my brain where I took the burgers back home and I cooked them on the grill and they were just as delicious uh, as any other burger that I had ever had before. And this is kind of when I started digging in into plant-based diets 
and the effects that it has on the environment. So uh, I'm kind of a, you know, a, a late adopter to the, the vegan diet. I, I'm still kind of a little bit of a, a flexitarian. But what I did figure out is that every time you choose to eat something or buy something or even grow something, it's a it's kind of a choice that you're making and, and, and in a way it's a vote for the planet and uh you know uh after i had figured that out uh, you know uh, i think my duty was to make plant-based foods really delicious and indulgent uh and promote them uh you know not only with my fellow chefs and and people that i, I feed in my in my restaurants uh but really everyone that 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 you know not it doesn't necessarily need to be vegan or vegetarian, uh, but just want to make some better choices in their lives that really affect the environment. So, you know, th this platform that Beyond Meat gave me to just make really, really delicious food and open up a, a restaurant with you guys called uh, Plant Burger has been a wild ride. Uh, it's It's been a very educational for me learning about how it does affect the environment in so many different ways, a lot less land, a lot less water. Uh, and if you can package this all up into a, a fun atmosphere and in the restaurant with delicious food, uh, I think that's kind of what makes all the difference. Uh, so that's kind of what, you know, how, how I see and how I've been enjoying it. So, uh, and even we're seeing with the work I'm doing uh, in DC um, uh, with the Food Policy Council and the work we do with schools, we're seeing plant-based diets be a lot more relevant in schools and be a subject where people are really just learning, you know, kids are learning about plants and how to grow these ingredients and how to use them and how that does have an effect on climate change as well. So uh, it's, it's been a, you know, a, a great, great little ride. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much, Spike. Uh, I think that's one of the coolest parts about Plant Burger is that it's really, it's a subliminal approach. It's just about making food uh, that people want to eat and they connect to and they recognize as maybe a part of their culture or a comfort food that they're craving um, and feeding them that. And then as an afternote saying, by the way, this is really essential for the climate and you've done, um, you've done something really positive for your carbon footprint just by making those choices. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the key. Just said, uh, you know, uh, as a human race, we, we, we really lean into comfort food, especially during uh, these tough times that we're experiencing right now. Uh, and if we can take that notion of just comfort, that comfort food doesn't have to be animal based, uh, you know, it can be plant based and just as delicious is kind of where we win here. And I think we, 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 we turn a lot of people and open up their views on the foods that they're eating. Uh, you know, I shared with some of you guys on the text chain not too long ago, this, this fried, uh, this cauliflower fried chicken that we made the other day. And it kind of blew my mind. It was the first time we tried doing something, uh, you know, you know, kind of imitating fried chicken with cauliflower and just the textures and the flavor and the crisp and everything. It was just as indulgent, just as memorable as anything else I've ever eaten in the past. And those are kind of the things I like to bring to the table and have fun with. So, and, uh, Jonah, you're also a really good taster for that. So thank you for... It's, it's my, my pleasure. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Tracy, I wanted to um, kind of turn that on, on, on your initiative as well, because um, what, what you're focused on is opening people's mind and helping them transition their diets towards a plant-based diet as well. Um, and as, as you said, you know, you're a public health nutritionist, an author, an activist, the director of the first federally funded vegan nutrition program. Um, and, and I think what's so essential about your work is that you're focusing on communities that have historically been um, marginalized and uh, the victims of the meat industry marketing and uh, predatory practices. Um, and I wanted to ask, why is this initiative, specifically the uh, By Any Greens Necessary and the 10,000 Black Women Initiative, so essential and important to you? And how do you see climate justice evolving in this next year? How do you hope it progresses? Well, I... Um it's a big question. Um, so I think that first I will say that um, it's important to me that uh, I focus on uh, communities of color, on Black folks in particular, because um, this is how I learned about veganism 33 years ago, not only from Dick Gregory, but from the community in DC. And, um, you know, the, 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 the very first 
all vegan, 100% vegan establishments in the city starting in the 70s were all black owned. And that was from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, there were between 12 and 15 um, 100% vegan establishments, black owned and low income vegan communities throughout the city. And I immersed myself in this community and that's where I actually learned how to be vegan, how to make it delicious, practical. So, so vegetarian restaurant um, was one of the places that I love because I could have soul food, right? Um, traditional soul food on those um, special occasions that we would eat them growing up and just have vegan versions. And they had, um, you know, delicious food. Um, and so that was, so for me, this is this is natural. This is normal to to for it for me to to kind of share this with with more Black folks, right? Because this is it's part of my culture already. Um, so this is kind of how I talk about it, and also because it's been a part of my culture, um, it's been a part of my uh, DC culture for the last thirty three years. I also have been uh, involved with it when it comes to climate justice, social justice, um, systemic, dismantling systemic oppression, systemic white supremacy in this country, exploitation, extraction, all of these things are interrelated. Um, they cannot be um, disassociated, right? They never have in, my, in the way that I learned veganism, in the way that I teach it, and in the community in which I practice it. So they're, they've always been connected. And so for me, it's just uh, kind of expanding this movement even further, right? Um, and so letting folks know that this is part of our cultural heritage. This is delicious food we've always had. And um, so that's the first piece, right? I always start with that historical foundation. That's important to me. And then, um, you know, we are, because of systemic oppression in this country, African Americans are experiencing the worst health outcomes. Particularly, we see that with COVID-19, right? That's 400 years in the making. That should not be a surprise to anyone. Um, so while we're dealing with um, the disma dismantling these uh, systems, while we're, you know, hopefully going to be talking about that during COVID-19 and after, we also have agency to take back control of our health. And one of the best ways to do that is to eat more plant-based foods. And so that's the uh, focus that I have during this crisis, during this pandemic that we're talking about. And then also globally, um, just in terms of climate change and global warming, black and brown communities across the world um, in um, countries that have the fewest resources that are the poorest, are impacted the most. So this is a, you know, this obviously is a global issue for black and brown people in particular too, um, whereas um, affluent whites are most protected. Right. So, um, you know, it's, again, it's all interrelated. So I talk about these issues um, in terms of dealing with the larger issues of, of, of exploitation, extraction, how do we address that, but also how we take back control of our health and, and exercise our, our own personal agency. Um, and we do that through food, um, learning why we eat this way, how to make it affordable, why we eat the way that we eat, whether it's, um, it's omnivore or vegetarian or vegan, why we should eat more or all plant-based foods, how to make it delicious, affordable, convenient, how to grow it ourselves, all of the ways that we can make this practical for people. And when we get more people to eat this way, then we will be addressing not only, obviously, um, personal health, right? We'll be um, addressing the disproportionate impacts of diabetes, obesity, heart disease, high cholesterol, strokes, certain cancers on communities of color around the country and really around the world, but we'll be addressing climate change at the same time. So I guess I, you know, I'm, all of that is, is um, leads me to this program that I'm doing right now. I launched it, 10,000 Black Vegan Women. I launched it in February, of course, not expecting to mm. be, uh, you know, for it to be so relevant, right? This pandemic is really an opportunity for me to explain to folks um, why it is so crucial 
um, you know, and so I see it, you know, I mean, I had to postpone the lot, the official launch until October because um, we are going to be doing 21 day vegan kickstarts. It's going to be a pretty intensive free program, but people right now don't have access um, to uh, the, the food, the, um, the income, you know, there are a lot of reasons why people may not be able to participate in this program now. So hopefully when we come out to the other side of it by the fall, um, you know, people will be ready to embark on this journey with me. And in the meantime, I'm providing um, weekly newsletters, information to folks to, to help them do what they can during this, during this time. That's phenomenal. Um, thank you so much, Tracy, for, for what you do. And I think the, one of the most amazing things about just hearing you speak is that you're, you're making these connections between these problems that may be seen as disparate, right? There's this notion that um, food justice is not in any way related to uh, racial or social justice. And you're just spelling that notion and really helping people to see that if we're able to create food security and food resiliency and reclaim our health as communities, we can create um, you know, a, a world that's going to be fair and, and better and healthier uh, and regenerative in nature in the long run. Um, and that when it comes to you know, the climate crisis or um, or global warming and addressing the, the climate chaos that um, we know is already happening. Uh, I, I think that helping people recognize this is going to serve you better right now anyways, uh, but it, it also is going to help us stay strong and connected um, and vibrant as a community in a decade uh, is, is a really essential piece of the equation. So thank you so much for, for doing that work. Thanks. Excellent. Chad, I, I wanted to ask you, um, with your work in, in Drawdown, you know, uh, for anyone who hasn't seen it, I really recommend, recommend uh, that you watch Chad's TED Talk, where he breaks down what Drawdown's really all about. Um, it was really influential to me, uh, and, and I loved watching it. And um, effectively, you've mapped the most impactful solutions to reverse global warming. Uh, would you mind just explaining a little bit more about the inspiration and the, the, the team that came together to do this, um, the impetus maybe, and then from there, what were the most surprising discoveries of this immense research endeavor? Sure, uh, yeah, thanks, be happy to. So, so Project Drawdown was first uh, conceived, I would say, in the mind of Paul Hawken and Amanda Joy Ravenhill around 2013, when they were sort of looking out uh, at the world and, and uh, we had been focusing so much as a community around climate and how we can take actions around the problem statement, right? What is global warming? What is its effect on climate? But there really wasn't a substantive list of real existing things that, that we could put our hands on today uh, that are solutions to the problem statement. We were just so focused on the problems. And so uh, Amanda and, uh, and, and, and Paul got together and then brought me on in 2014. The three of us uh, uh, started Project Drawdown officially in 2014. Um, and uh, we set out uh, on three core pillars uh, that really define Project Drawdown. One is the sense of we need to approach this as from a systems perspective and working together in a collaborative space, right? We're not gonna do this from typical hierarchical models. We need to link arms, come together, and, uh, uh, and be a collaboration of the worlds, uh, of all the great things that are happening around the world today, and to be a mirror reflecting upon the world, what it's already doing, what it already knows. And so that collaboration fed into this research project. So how do we aggregate all of this great knowledge that humanity has on real workable solutions that are actually already being implemented, already scaling around the world, and how do we, for the first time, bring it together so that we can look at all of these different technologies and practices as apples to apples to apples to apples and see how they intersect as a system, a system of solutions? Because we've got to remember, all of these solutions do not exist in isolation. None of them, not one of them. All of them are working together as part of a system and ultimately part of a system of systems. We think about energy, we think about transportation, we think about buildings, we think about waste, we think about materials, industry, we think about food systems, agriculture, we think about our human social uh, uh, systems of education and economy. These are all intertwined together. 
So we have to map these solutions out as a full system. And we were the first uh, organization to do that. Um, and then ultimately, uh, that's not enough. You can't just be a collaboration and aggregate all this great knowledge and build these great global models and do all this data analysis and so on. You got to communicate it. You got to be able to take that information and make it usable and meaningful for many different types of audiences so that we can change the discourse, change the way we think about, the way we, we act on global warming by, by really switching the conversation from problem fixing to solution, right? We need to create the future that we want with the solutions at hand. And then think about instead of fear mongering and getting really caught down in the, the paralyzation of fear and instead take that fear as a little bit and then move to the possibility. What is the possibility those solutions can actually achieve when we think about it as a system? And then move away from the conflict to one of collaboration. So when we get into that mixture of solution, possibility, and collaboration, we create opportunities, right? So we need to think about the solutions to the, the, the system, how we, as, as Tracy so correctly pointed out, how we change the system from exploitation to regeneration, how we change the entire system as a system. Uh, we, we need to think about this um, as uh, the future and, and how we can, how we can, what we can do today to make that future, future real, right? We, we can't be looking to the past. We can't be fixing things and tinkering things. We want to create that future. And I think it's really fundamentally important. And as, and as Tracy points out, when we think about that system shift, it's not even really about climate. And I think, I think uh, Joan, I want to really stress this point. We set out here to, to create a regenerative system because of all the other cascading benefits. We get to solve the climate crisis while we address human rights, gender equity, and economic improvement for all people. We get to provide clean, abundant access to energy. We get to, we get to uh, reduce air pollution. We provide, uh, uh, bring soil back to the land. We, uh, we provide benefit to farmers from small scale to large operations. We feed the world with abundance. We, we, uh, we protect our ecosystems, we protect our oceans, our terrestrial systems, our wetlands. It's just, it goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And for those of you who are profit oriented, I've never worked for a for profit company my whole life. I know some of you on this call are. I haven't, that's fine. If you are interested in that profit model, you're gonna make money because the return on investment of that system of solutions is three or four times more than we put into it. And when we shift that system, we shift fundamentally the mindsets of how we approach the world today. We move from extraction exploitation to the abundance of renewable systems, restorative systems, and it changes the game entirely. So how we do it, matters just as much as what we are doing. And I think uh, when we approach it as a systemic level and really embed throughout the thread of everything, social justice, equity, and equality, and these are all different concepts, together in that system, that's how we can actually make the change that we need and create the future we want. Phenomenal. Yeah, it struck me that there's this consilient nature, this uh, intersectionality that often is overlooked when we're thinking about solutions. And what Drawdown and what you and, and your work do so well is help people realize, you know, this is actually, um, by addressing them all together, we're able to create a systemic change that um, is so meaningful. I was wondering, would you be able to share with us an example or some manifestation of um, these solutions being implemented? Um, what, what do you mean? Like an actual... So all these solutions that we're profiling at Drawdown are already being implemented in different parts of the world. So there's lots of examples of, of that. Um, is that. Is that what you're referring to? How a specific case of how some of these are being done? Well, yeah, or how your research and how your platform has served to accelerate the implementation of, um, oh, of one of the sure. So there's lots of examples. Um, and it's, it's, in some sense, it's how do we are inspiring businesses, individuals, policymakers across scales, across levels of agency to suddenly realize what is possible and what already is there. Um, and then we need both bottom-up approaches, so individual action, as well as top-down. We surely, we do need policymakers to take really proactive uh, approaches to incentivize and change the, the structure of our system in order to incentivize these solutions. 
but we also need the middle out. We need institutional transformation, which means corporations, communities, uh, financial systems, educational platforms. How do we, the eye of the policymakers and the eye of individuals from the bottom up meet in the middle to, as the we? That's where we're gonna make the most substantive change and that's happening all over the world. And in some sense, Drawdown has shown a light onto what these solutions are as a starting point. Because I think one of the greatest barriers from, for action has been people kind of understand the broad contours of the problem areas. They I mean, we understand energy systems need to be transformed. We can think about transportation, but very, very few people can sit there and say, I understand or know what are the specific technologies and practices that are meaningful to my level of agency that I can take action on. And so what Drawdown has done is provided a really clear list of an integrated system that anybody can find their own adventure, so their passion that makes them get excited about what they do on a daily basis, whether it's for work or for their own pleasure or for their homes. They can find a solution or a set of solutions that are meaningful to them. And if there's just countless examples from, from, again, from policymakers taking action to corporations to uh, businesses and individuals, communities. I mean, Drawdown has really kind of gone out to the world to be an inspiring message, but also a toolkit that people can go to to find you know scientifically valid data driven uh, uh, assessments of these technologies and practices and behaviors that need to be shifted and i think that's um uh, there's there's this there's probably too many examples to count uh, or to, to recall here but i think that's the really the key point is is drawn on as sort of the this way to find what is meaningful for you in your level of agency and so all these different levels of agency can actually come together and link arms Excellent. Well, it's certainly um, how it's changed my life and, and uh, my family's life as well. And uh, just providing that that list and the resources and again, helping people to access what exactly can you be a part of um, is is the manifestation. I think uh, the people here are all part of those solutions, too. So um, thank you again for, for that. And uh, Seth, I wanted to ask a question as the founder of this new entity, Eat the Change. Um, it's about supporting initiatives and creating initiatives and, and businesses that help people to connect those dots in a lot of the, the same way that Tracy and Chad are uh, between the environment and their diets. Um, diet being actually one of the most uh, impactful ways that every person has control over um, the world that, that is created in the economy. Um, I'm hoping, you know, would you be able to share with us how, how this all came to be um, and how you hope this platform can influence people in business? Sure, yeah, and I, I want to say what a pleasure it is to be on this panel with, with Tracy and Chad and Spike because uh, what's really neat is we're talking about solutions and, and uh, off, I think about five, ten years ago, Earth Day panels were all about how bad everything is and it is, it's bad, it's, it's serious. But I, I really appreciate that we're also now talking about and what do we do about it? So rather than just wringing our hands, we're talking about activism. We're talking about disseminating information and informing people so we can take action. And, and, and to me, that's what's critical. And that's what Eat the Change is. It's this phrase. It's really an imperative. It's a call to action. It's trying to mobilize people. And so we need the information like what Drawdown is doing. And I, I note that of the top 20 solutions ranked in Eat the Change, eight of them are food related. And then uh, we need activism too, like what the work that Tracy's doing, where we can inform and inspire people to pursue uh, different approaches and rethink uh, what they've been eating. And so I think those are critical. And, and so really what we hope is, uh, I see the change as part of a movement. And, and uh, there's the nonprofit piece that's essential and the for-profit piece. And so um, just as you heard Spike say, you know, when we can make uh, plant-based food taste delicious, be accessible, be price accessible, be distribution accessible, um, then you can really start to move the needle. I, I'm really uh, proud of the fact that it, you know, with the first plant burger is located in Silver Spring, Maryland. It's by no means um, the first place someone would think about locating a vegan restaurant, but to see the kind of response the community's gotten there, to me, is is really exciting. So um, we certainly, as I think about what Eat the Change is trying to do, it's really hoping to catalyze all types of people. It's, it's, it's certainly uh, consumers, it's other businesses, it's nonprofits and governments too, to recognize that um, the single biggest impact any of us can have on a daily basis 
in terms of our impact on the planet is by, cho by thinking about what we eat. So that um, being intentional with our dietary choices is just critical. And just to uh, reinforce, you know, at least with respect to uh, a Beyond Burger versus a, a cow-based burger, it uses 99% less water, 93% less land. I mean, those are fundamental differences, 90% less energy. So major, not just sort of slightly better, not just, you know, percentages better, but multiple times better. And as we think about scaling um, the, the global population to uh, have more protein in their diet, um, we have to make these kind of choices and we have to make them accessible, uh, delicious and available. Phenomenal. That's, couldn't have said it better. Um, and uh, I think, you know, wrapping this up and, and trying to tie in all together these different uh, perspectives that we have, you know, we have activism and we have um, the for-profit side and we have the research uh, <coughs> nonprofit side, um, I, I wanna take a moment to kind of reflect on this time that we are living in. Um, really, it's unprecedented that uh, we, we were all experiencing together the coronavirus um, and simultaneously uh, the impact of, um, of climate change is, is really upon uh, us as a human race. Uh, I wanted to ask all of you and feel free to you know, bounce, bounce around and, and um, share your thoughts on this. What out of this situation, what out of this tragedy can we change for the better uh, in our lives and in the world um, that we can come away as uh, having, having a world that is healthier, cleaner, um, more regenerative in nature? I'll take a crack at it first, if that's okay, Jonah. I, I think one of the things that this has helped reinforce is that facts really matter. And so, uh, you know, there are, there are still folks out there who deny climate change or who deny that, you know, um, there's the science um, makes a difference here. And, and I think we're seeing the consequences of that from a health perspective, but there's also this happening from a, a, a climate perspective too. And so I hope uh, facts uh, gain more respect as uh, being relevant to this to this part of the conversation. And then the other piece I'd add is that I hope connect people get a, a clearer sense of connection and, and the fact that everything we do in this planet is connected and the actions we take here make it have an impact in all over the world. Obviously, the actions of some people in China have an act, uh, impact all over the world as well. And and I I, I hope both uh, if we can elevate the respect we have for facts and connectedness that that would be a positive outcome yeah and, and Jenna, i'll go ahead and jump in and just say i think you know one of the things that that could hopefully come out of this is that people realize how important all our small businesses really are they're really the pillars of our communities and our micro communities and and that food is is something that we we all have in common we all need it to survive and and uh, we need to treat it with a, a lot more respect and, and, and realize that, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times food and, and these systems and, and these farm bills uh, is treated as a privilege. Uh, and, you know, food should be a right for every human being. And, uh, you know, the more we can make the right choices on, on the types of food we decide to grow and how we grow and what we put into our bodies, I think uh, the better we, we will all be and, and we can use a, you know, a great dose of balance in, in our food system right now. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the other big thing is just the, you know, realizing how free we really are in this world, uh, as much as we want to complain about so many different things and restrictions and, and what have you, uh, a pandemic like this, keeping us all quarantined in our house uh, makes us realize uh, how fortunate a lot of us are. Uh, and to realize that the, there's a lot of people in this world that are, not as fortunate and on top of it now going through this coronavirus uh, is, is uh, just a nightmare. So, um, you know, just, just uh, appreciating ourselves a lot more, so. Uh, I'll jump, um, I will, uh, there, there are layers that I'm feeling around this. I mean, I personally work from home, so this hasn't, that hasn't changed. Um, and I'm, I'm loving the quiet and the peace 
and not just in the in the you know in the city around me but also just in my mind and in my my space um and so there's that right so i i have definitely days of anxiety and stress especially in the beginning um but i'm you know kind of learning how to deal with that and to be to be more mellow and get back into my rhythm um so you know I'm, I'm grateful, as Seth and, and Jonah said, to have connections with family and friends, with, with folks that I work with, and, um, you know, to be able to be home. And so there's that layer, right? And then the other layer, you know, and then, you know, just seeing that the, that the world, that, or at least the world around me in this area, um, is a, a little cleaner, a little quieter, a little more pristine, right? That's wonderful. Um, but then on the other hand, the other layer is that most, you know, it just throws up the, the, uh, the systemic, um, you know, exploitation, uh, oppression that is, you know, that, that exists, you know, not, again, none of it is a surprise, but it's just thrown up uh, just in a really uh, dramatic way that, um, we cannot go back to the way things work. That's not acceptable. And uh, the fact that the, it, you know, the Trump administration businesses are trying to, or seemingly like they are trying to get us to go back sooner uh, than we should, means that there may be some gaslighting that's gonna happen to try to get us to go back to the way things were. And that's just, you know, it's unacceptable. It was never acceptable. There are always people working and fighting against the, the you know, these, the way that things were before the pandemic. But I hope that more people see that we cannot go back to that. Um, and so there's, you know, there's bringing that into clear relief, I think, for, for a lot of people who knew it, who've been working, uh, you know, in it, but for a lot of people who hadn't seen it, right? There's that layer too. Um, and then, you know, just the fact that Black folks are, are more likely to get it, uh, to get COVID-19 and to die from it um, uh, in general. And then particularly in New York, you have Latinx communities that are more, most affected. Um, I mean, this is just horrific. And uh, it's, again, a systemic issue that has to be dealt with now and after we come to we come out of the other side of this we you know and so this conversation needs to continue um in in places where it was not happening it was definitely happening in places that i frequent you know and, and uh you know places that i know about and have been reading about and in working with but this larger conversation that we're having now has to continue um and uh i don't want that to you know, I'm glad it's happening now and I don't want that to end. So that to me is a crucial part. And the final layer mm -hmm. is, you know, what I mentioned before is that hopefully people will be eating healthier now. I think the fact that people are home and they're cooking more, they're thinking about how they can be help, be more helpful now and how they can build up their immune systems, you know, for, you know, future crises that may occur. They're just looking for more health information and how to eat healthier and how to be healthier for themselves and their families. And so that opens up an opportunity for us who work in the plant-based movement, you know, to kind of expand our message. Um, so we have more eyes and ears that are, that are receptive to it. So I love that piece of it too. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> like those layers. The earth is made of layers, so. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Amazing. Um, Chad, did you want to add anything uh, with regard to the current situation of the health crisis? No. I mean, to be honest, uh, what Tracy and, 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 uh, and Seth and, and, uh, and everyone in, uh, on, on here uh, just said was, was, was very well said, and I couldn't, I couldn't really add more. To be honest, and I, I would just echo everything that Tracy just said, and I want to leave on like that. So, perfectly, like spot on. Um, so I want to just honor that. Yeah. Well, excellent. Um, I want to just give everyone one last chance. If you have 
a final message that, um, you know, people who are at home who have a lot of time on their hands, one piece of advice or, or a quote, if you'd like to share, um, that anyone who's at home listening, wondering how they can celebrate Earth Day uh, today, and, and again, keep this conversation going, what, what's maybe one quote or one, one hope that you might want to leave them with? Well, for me, it's, it's uh, cook some delicious uh, food, and share it with your family, uh, have a good time, enjoy this moment, um, make it plant-based if you're, you're, you're willing to, and uh, just think about, you know, all, uh, all the work out there that our farmers uh, do to provide us all this food and, and the crisis that they're also going through, and, and uh, make sure to appreciate them uh, when things hopefully normalize to whatever the new normal will be, so, and, and stay safe. I'll just add on to what Spike said. I think sometimes people who are eating plant-based diets sometimes feel a little nervous about trying to convince others to do that. Um, but what you could do is pass on a, your favorite recipe and say, hey, you, get, you know, you're cooking at home, try this recipe. Oh, you know, by the way, it's plant-based, but, but, you know, and, and in fact, I think we posted uh, the chili recipe that we sell at Plant Burger. We posted that online. So, you know, people could use that as a, an example of a great tasting plant-based recipe someone should try to make at home. Mm -hmm. um i would say two things liberate your mind and your mouth will follow and it's about your greens not your genes <laughs> excellent i guess i would just say take this time as an opportunity to learn and experience something that you uh weren't familiar with before. we're already in the process of learning all the time being almost forced to uh, being in our homes and being quarantined, but don't see it as a disadvantage. Take it as an advantage. What can you do to learn a little bit more that you weren't thinking about before? And whether that's being a plant-based diet or a plant-rich diet or changing, learning a new recipe or reaching out to some of the people in your neighborhood or community that maybe you ha can't be next to, but you can practice a little bit of social distancing. Go out there and just do something different that you haven't really done maybe in a long time. And this is an opportunity for you to do it. And when you start to do that, I think we're going to, we're going to, uh, you know, take the next step and we get out of this crisis to being a little bit more connected to ourselves uh, as we go through this process, but also to our neighbors, to our communities outside when we are actually able to interact. And so take this as a learning opportunity uh, and something to experience something different. Just, just do something totally bold, totally different than what you would normally do within the confines that we are in right now and take this as a fun experience and not just as something that's being forced upon you. We can make this as an opportunity and hey, I'm a, I'm a king of silver linings. I wanna see this as something positive. Recognizing on the same hand that this is very tragic for many people, we have to always recognize that, but what can we do to, to see this as an opportunity to um, be more connected to ourselves and to our communities? Very true. Um, that's, it's just, it, it brings me so much joy to, to see you all and to hear your thoughts and your perspectives and all of these amazing solutions that you're a part of. Um, one final quote I'll, I'll leave us with um, that kind of connects to out of chaos and out of crisis can come opportunity. And as we think about Earth Day and, and the past and moving forward, um, it's a great quote that we have uh, at, at Plant Burger, which is, we can't go back and change the beginning, but we can start where we are and change the ending. Uh, and so on that note, let us all go forward um, to continue celebrating Earth Day, to continue having these important conversations. Uh, let's continue to, nur to nourish our, ourselves and our minds and think about how we can preserve this wonderful planet and the ecosystem services we all depend upon for the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Be well. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you all so much.